Hello, and welcome to Chapter 3. In this lecture accompanying the slides for Chapter 3, we're going to cover the topics of orbits and gravity. This is a pretty heavy chapter, one of the most in the book, so please pay attention as much as you can and just be aware of the content in this one. All right, so here we're looking at the International Space Station, sort of the pinnacle of modern satellites, a, uh, a laboratory and home to astronauts for several months at a time in some cases that is falling around Earth at around 6,500 kilometers per second, okay? making an orbit every 90 minutes. So how did we get to this point, right? What, what, brought, us, what brought us to this? Well, we're going to take kind of observation-based astronomy and follow that thread through to the beginnings of modern physics. So we're gonna have a bridge here from astronomy to physics. This is going to happen because we're going from what are called the laws of planetary motion, which were developed by this man here, Johannes Kepler. They're also known as Kepler's laws. And we're gonna relate those directly to Newton's laws of motion and law of universal gravitation. How do we get to this point? Well, if you look at the, you know, even this point, if you look at the last lecture where I briefly talked about some background, some history of astronomy, I mentioned Galileo. And really, there's a, a thread here going from Galileo, Galileo and, re, and rejecting the geocentric model of the solar system, that the Earth was at the center, and accepting the Copernican model that the sun was at the center of the solar system. And then revealing that this explained phenomenon like apparent retrograde motion, explained phenomenon like the moons of Jupiter, and the phases of Venus, right? So these were things now that became acceptable and understood, and we started to understand that there were universal laws that governed moons of other planets, that we weren't, that our moon was not special, but that planets have moons. We were just one example of that. And to do that, to make those general statements, to have universal laws, whether they're those of Kepler or in a moment Newton, we had to have observation. And of course, that's what Galileo did. And again, I mentioned that briefly in the last lecture, that Galileo paved the way through to acceptance of new theories and development of new theories through direct observation, looking through a telescope, okay? Well, my point is this man, this rather colorful character here, is Tycho Brahe. And what Tycho Brahe did was a huge body of observations, okay? And this was in the 1500s, the mid 1500s, right? A, a really a contemporary of Galileo, all right? At least Galileo in his later life. So, what what's the significance of that? Well, he made so many detailed observations of the sky. This man did that. That body of data was crucial. It was a unprecedented body of data that could be used and thus move science forward. Right? Because you can have the best idea, but it's little more than a guess unless it's testable. Then it becomes a hypothesis. But how is it testable if there's no data? Right? Unlike chemistry where you smash things together and burn them, or even physics where you could do an experiment on a tabletop, astronomy ultimately comes down to looking up into the sky. And someone's got to do that. And that's what Tycho Brahe did. Tycho Brahe wasn't a great theorist. This man here is, and nothing is credited to him in terms of really coming up with the big ideas. Instead, he just rather idiosyncratically, even eccentrically, collected lots and lots of data. In fact, he was a known eccentric. He was a very wealthy eccentric that just had a lot of free time on his hands and incredible wealth, okay? But here's the interesting connection. He hired Johannes Kepler, okay, a German mathematician and astronomer, as somewhat of an assistant because Kepler came from, modest, from a modest family, right? He was, he was not wealthy, right? He was able to attend university due to the, be, you know, the being like a benefactor of sort of trust money from more wealthy characters like Tycho Brahe. And the thing is that when Tycho Brahe died, he left all of his observation data 
to Johannes Kepler, who then continued on with a you know with the um, the education behind him now and was able to see trends in that data and develop the laws of planetary motion. Okay, so this is the this is this turning point in history, understanding the commonality between the motions of objects in the sky, which is really the motions of objects in the vastness of space. All right. So let's talk about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Okay. So, excuse me, the first two I'll, I'll talk about on these slides here for figures 3.3 um, and 3.4. Okay. Then I'll summarize um, the, actually I'll talk about um, the, sec the second one here. Okay. All right. Just um, anyway. So the first law of planetary motion is that all orbits are ellipses. Okay, and these are Kepler's laws. Okay, and the first law, all orbits are ellipses. Okay, now what is an ellipse? Well, an ellipse is this thing right here, okay? It's a stretched out circle. We call it a conic section, which is a mathematical term, because an ellipse comes from an imaginary slice through a cone. A angled slice that goes all the way through the cone is an ellipse. An exactly level slice that goes all the way through the cone is a circle. A circle is just a type of ellipse because they both have in common that they go all the way through a cone. A parabola, on the other hand, is a conic section, but not an ellipse, because it comes out of the bottom. And a steep parabola is called a hyperbola. The difference is inconsequential to this class, okay? Now, the idea of parabola is somewhat consequential because a object that is not in orbit is free, okay? And if it's not in free, it follows a parabolic path. I'll mention that in a minute, okay? Just hold on to that thought. Now, the first law of Kepler's laws is all orbits are ellipses, okay? Because orbits are not free. That's a trapped body. Our moon is trapped to us. The earth is trapped to the sun. It is stuck around it, thus it's orbiting it. Thus, it's an ellipse. Some ellipses are quite circular, right? Hard to tell them from a perfect circle, right? Now, could they, could they be an exact perfect circle? No, because there's always some tiny other pulling force, some disturbance from it being a perfect ellipse, okay? So, or a perfect circle for that matter. Now, all right, so that's just the first law. Now, interesting thing about ellipses, you can draw an ellipse by sticking two, like, thumbtacks into a piece of paper, getting a string, pulling that string taut, right? So it's taut here, the string is taut along this line here, and then keeping it taut the whole time, so you're not introducing any slack into the string, and just kind of pushing your pencil along this path, the pencil will naturally draw out an ellipse. If on the other hand, you brought these two thumbtacks together, and you just put them, you know, kind of right next to each other, then, and you did the same thing, well, what would you have? Well, in that case, you would just draw a circle, right? Because you'd just be holding the string taut like this, and you just go around in a circle because it would just be the radius. So you see then that the difference between an ellipse and a circle is just how close these two thumbtacks are to each other. Well, with those thumbtacks have a name, they're actually called the foci, okay? And the idea with, with the foci is that they define the ellipse completely, completely. So mathematically speaking, knowing where those foci are relative to each other tells you all the properties about the ellipse. And in a very real orbital sense, the object that is being orbited is always one of the foci. So our sun, for example, will be located at one of the foci. Nothing is located at the other foci. It's just empty space. And then Earth would orbit along the path that the pencil would draw. Okay? And that, that's absolutely the case, that the sun and Earth have an elliptical orbit, and 
the sun is at one of the foci. Our orbit is fairly circular. The difference between closest approach and furthest approach is, um, is well less than 5% difference, okay? So I think I'd be, top of my head, I think right around 3%. So we're about 3% closer to the sun at closest approach and so on, right? That actually doesn't even make a difference for our seasons or anything like that, okay? So fairly circular orbit, but not perfect, okay? It is elliptical. So there are some orbits that are very elliptical, and you can imagine a case where a planet gets much closer to the sun at one part of its orbit and then much further away, like drawn here. If this planet with the E on it, you get very close sometime in its orbit and much further away, all right? Here's an example of that. So imagine there is some planet here called planet P, and it's orbiting around, and this is its orbit. Well, we see that in this region, the region labeled B, it's very close, very close to the sun that it's orbiting, okay? And this, this would be an orbit like Neptune or Pluto, a very elliptical orbit, vast differences in how close it gets, which means that there definitely would be a significance in the temperature. When the planet is here, it's picking up a lot more radiation from the sun. When it's many times further away, well, that's, that's gonna be a dramatic difference. Okay, you can only imagine then for planets that are distant from a star or a sun, our sun, then they're, you know, they could, for the, whatever part of the orbit where they're far away, they freeze up. You know, there'd be a pretty significant difference. The most dramatic a, a version of this at all is imagining a comet. So we'll call it C, because when a, a comet gets so far away that it really does just freeze into a, a, a packed ball of, of icy, dirty ice material. But when it gets close to the sun on its closest approach, well, it starts to evaporate. All that, that water, that frozen water that composes the comet starts to boil away. And it happens to boil away at very low temperature because it's not like space is all that warm even close to the sun, well, depending on how close you are. And, but the thing is that space is a vacuum. You know, it's, it, things are able to boil very, very easily in space because there's nothing, there's nothing preventing that boiling. There's nothing preventing those molecules from bouncing around very easily. And thus, the comets start to boil at a relatively low temperature. It happens when they kind of cross inward from the orbit of Mars or Earth, where they start to boil. And then, of course, what you have is you have a comet with a tail, because that's all the remnants of that, that evaporating comet. You know, what a dramatic example. Frozen, frozen ice ball in the distant solar system you know, many, many years later, Earth years passing by the sun and it's boiling as it flies past the sun, okay? Now, that's another thing to consider is that for these objects that have very elliptical orbits like this picture shows, that we're talking about an orbit that would probably be much, much longer than Earth's. And I'll tell you why we know that, why we, why we can make that quick assumption that an object that's further away that has a very large orbit and perhaps a very elliptical orbit that that orbit would take so much longer, the period of the orbit would be so much longer, but it is, okay? And again, I'll speak to that in just a minute, but that we, it could be hundreds of Earth years just to make one complete rotation, thousands of Earth years to make one complete elliptical rotation, okay? But here's the other piece of information in this figure before I move to the next slide, and that's that these, these shaded regions, A and B, take equal time to pass through, okay? Now, it's not like our planet is going literally passing through this shaded region. Of course, it's following the blue line. But what I mean is that go from this point to this point takes equal time. That's that T that's shown here, okay, the T, as going from this point to this point, okay? So I'll label it in the same place, okay? So to go from point three to point four takes time T, and to go to from point one to point two takes time T, equal time even though clearly the arc, the actual length of the dot, you know, the line, the curved line connecting points three and four is much shorter than the curved line connecting points one and two. Well, that's because our planet or comet is moving much faster when it's closer. All right, it's moving much faster when it's closer. And I'll say why, I'll come back to that because I, I have a quick, easy way for us to kind of make that believable based on everyday everyday experiences, you know, we see this type of phenomenon, but of course not with orbits, but we see it with things spinning. That's a hint, okay? But again, we'll, I'll come back to that idea as well. Now, here's the thing, okay? Is that, that, that means, right, faster planet 
when it's closer to the sun, faster comet. That's why I said that the comet was flying past the sun. If any of you followed the news recently, um, I guess kind of the like, you know, scientific interest, sort of general interest science news that you'll sometimes see, there was a comet that came up that was mentioned a few times. It was called Neowise, and it was visible in the sky on a few nights. But that's the thing. It's just a few nights. It was, it's the same when any comet comes by and you hear about comet viewing. Because they'll, they'll pass by the sun and thus be visible from Earth for just really a few days or weeks. And then, you know, and because they're moving so fast, then they'll slow down as they go back out into the distant solar system and spend hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years creeping through the distant solar system only to fly at huge speeds, very big velocities, and, you know, repeat the process in very, very small velocities when they're far away. Okay? Fascinating stuff, I hope. All right, so I, I promised that we would transition over from, from the laws, right? So, I, and I did want to call attention to one thing, right? So we clearly labeled that the first law was that all orbits are ellipses. The second law of Kepler's is the law of equal areas, which you can find, that's a great name for it, but it, it's what I was just talking about. It's the law that says that planets move faster when they're closer and slower when they're further away, okay? So it's the, right, it's the law of, uh, of speeding up when you're closer to the sun and slowing down when you're further away. That might be a, a better way of remembering it, okay? Now, before we talk about the third law, let's introduce Isaac Newton, okay? So notice Isaac Newton is, a, is in the 1600s. This is in compar comparison to the, you know, right up to the, the late 1500s leading up to 1601, okay? So we kind of have, you know, generation later, building on, building on more information, synthesizing that information. So what, what, is, what does Isaac Newton do, okay? So he formulates the laws of motion, not replacing Kepler's laws of, of planetary motion, but kind of explaining the background of them, right? Because his laws of motion should be universal. He didn't realize immediately how they were, but the, the, the goal of them, and it turns out they are, they're completely universal. So let's just summarize um, his three laws quickly, okay? So, the first law is the law of inertia. Okay, this is, says that objects stay in motion unless they're acted on by a force. Unless acted on by a force. So if something's moving, it'll just continue to move in that same direction unless you push or pull on it. Okay, that's, that's absolutely true. Now we, we take kind of forces for, for granted because we're always being pulled on by gravity. But if there wasn't, we'd just float off in forever in one direction, okay? It also tells us that things will stay at rest unless acted on by a force if they started at rest. Because rest is a form of motion. It's just a form of motion with no displacement, okay? Now, what's two? Well, two is the law of acceleration. And this one is best summed up with a very simple equation that just says F equals MA, because it tells us that F for force is equal to mass times acceleration. This tells us that if you want to accelerate something that has a big mass, then you're gonna need a big force. If you wanna accelerate something with a small mass, then you need a small force. On the other hand, if you want to accelerate something that has a small mass, but you want to accelerate it a lot, then you might need a big force, right? So it tells you that, it, that you might need a lot of force if you either want a big acceleration or you're accelerating something with a lot of mass. That's what the law tells us. And that completely makes sense. It's harder to push things. It's harder to, to speed things up if they're very massive. And it's also harder to speed something up really, really fast. Think about a car going from zero to 60 in one second versus you know 25 seconds. Right? Which one takes more force? So that's the law of acceleration. That was one of Newton's you know, really most fundamental laws. And the third one is the law of force pairs. Okay, now let's speak about the third law on the next slide. So here's a demonstra demonstration of Newton's third law, that force pair law, which I haven't spoken about much. The US space shuttle, powered by three fuel engines burning liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, with two solid fuel bo boosters demonstrate, demonstrates Newton's third law. How so? Well, what the heck's going on here? You know, rockets shoot up into space. We're like, oh yeah, sure, they're riding an explosion. That's fine, I mean, that, that makes sense. We see water rockets, we, 
we understand. I mean, we, rockets work, right? But fundamentally, how do we how do we break that down? How do we understand why a rocket works? Well, the idea is this. Okay, the the gas in the fuel, um, you know, the the fuel line, the fuel the fuel burst that's coming out of the back of the rocket, the burning liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. It is being pushed on by the rocket, right? Because think about it. It's this this gas is pushing out of the rocket. Okay, there's a force. Okay, pushing out that gas, isn't it? Right? There's a nozzle here, right? And you I mean think about it. Of course, you if if you're burning something and, and it's being pushed out of a nozzle, if it's being pushed out of the end of this this huge tube, right? This huge rocket chamber here. That's a pushing force. We'd all agree, right? It's like it's like pushing water out of a hose. Well, think about pushing water out of a hose. If you ever fired a fire hose, there's a kickback. If you ever fired a gun, there's a kickback. If you push something forward, it pushes back. And when you push all this burning gas out of the nozzle of the rocket, well, whatever the push is, is exactly equal to the push back, okay? The fuel that is being exhausted, the exhaust Gas is pushing back on the rocket. F, reaction. Okay? And by reaction, I just mean pushback. And that is what accelerates the rocket in the space. That's it. That's what it means to accelerate something. You push and you push back. And that's the beauty of rockets. That's how they can... You know, the whole idea of having exhaust, thrust, that's why the bur burning these things is so crucial because how else could we launch rockets? Otherwise, we would need a single force, like a giant slingshot, and that's actually impractical. There's, there's no way to really pull that off, but here we can because it will be a continual force because we can push for a while and continue to accelerate rather than having to accelerate all at once. It's remarkable to think of, okay? So that's it. Those are Newton's three laws. Excuse me. Law of inertia, law of acceleration, law of force pairs. Now, all right, fundamental stuff. So, I said that we would, I would explain Newton's, excuse me, Kepler's second law a bit more with a simple everyday um, demonstration or idea, and it's this right here. It's the idea of conservation of angular momentum, because the fact that planets are moving faster when they're closer to the sun and moving slower when they're further away is is explained by Kepler's second law, but it's also explained by the law of conservation of angular momentum. All right? So we can say that it's equivalent to Kepler's third law. And the Kepler's third, oh, excuse me, second, second law. Okay, we haven't so spoken about his third law. And it's equivalent to the idea of the ice skater Showing here, this woman ice skater, she has her arms out in this one. She's spinning somewhat slowly, okay, so she would have kind of a slow velocity. She pulls her arms in, and what happens, right? She has a much larger velocity. She's speeding much faster, okay? I mean, that's the idea. And what she's done is she has changed the properties of her mass distribution, and in doing so, she is speeding up because angular momentum which takes into account both mass, and mass, and speed, has to be unchanging. So her mass changed in a way because the way the mass is distributed has changed. Before she had mass way out of the ends, now she has all of her mass in the middle. And that change of distribution of mass means that the velocity has to change to compensate because the angular momentum, I'm not, and you don't need to know the formula for it, but the angular momentum has to be conserved, okay? Planets have to go faster when they're closer to a star. Moons have to go faster when they're closer to the planet that they orbit. Comets have to go faster when they're closer to the sun, okay? The ice skater must spin faster when she pulls her arms in because her arms are closer to her body, okay? See, it's the same idea. Okay? All right. So we're going to talk about um, Kepler's third law, but to do that, let's motivate with the idea of satellites. Okay? And I'll mention both artificial and natural satellites.
But here we have some astronauts in free fall and they are in a artificial satellite, okay? So they're experiencing what it, what it feels like weightlessness, but it's not weightlessness because there's no gravity, all right? There is still gravity, quite a bit. When astronauts are in the International Space Station, they're about 300 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That's high, but that's nothing compared to the diameter of the Earth or the radius of the Earth, which is 6,300 kilometers. Imagine a ball that is 63 centimeters in radius. And then imagine holding your finger three centimeters above its surface. Well, 63 centimeters, that's like a big beach ball. Three centimeters is like an inch. If you hold your finger an inch above a beach ball, it doesn't feel like you're that far away from the beach ball. Likewise, the International Space Station is not very far from Earth, okay? It's quite close. You can kind of see from the pictures, you know, it's the Earth takes up most of their field of view when they look down towards it. Now, it's above the atmosphere, which is crucial, so it doesn't burn up. But the idea is that there's still plenty of gravity there, plenty. And the weightlessness is only a illusion. It's only because they are in free fall. Every satellite, including those with people in them, like this one, is in free fall. It is just falling towards the earth, okay? But it never hits the earth, at least not not very quickly. It would take a very long time for it to hit the earth. And it can be avoided from hitting the earth by expending a little bit of fuel now and then. Okay? How, how the heck is that? Well, that's another idea we're going to hold on to. Okay? But this is the idea. So how do satellites work? How do you pull that off? How do you not hit the earth even though you're falling towards it? And how does that relate to the laws of motion and this third law, third law of Kepler that I haven't talked about yet? Okay? Well, let's carry on. So... Let's think about orbits. Now, so far we have, we have thought about orbits because we thought about Kepler's second law. And I went ahead and said, hey, that's actually just angular momentum. It's just this, this thing that's conserved, angular momentum, okay? Angular momentum is a special quantity that takes into account mass and velocity and it's conserved, okay? Specifically, rotational velocity. Now, and conserved just means unchanging. You can't, you, it's, it's not, you know, it, it, doesn't just like disappear or um, you know um, appear out of nowhere. Okay, you have to add something to the system to change it. Now, let's look at these these orbits. Okay, some good examples of orbits. We see some are quite um, circular, which is a good throwback to Kepler's first law. We see some like this one for um, uh, let's see, we have Kopf here. Okay, Kopf. Well, we see Kopf's orbit is definitely like the ellipse, kind of like in the example with the tax. We have this one, Halley, which looks like it's a parabola, okay? Looks like it's actually not an ellipse at all, but it's just so big it doesn't fit on the page, okay? That, that's the Halley one. So Halley's a comet, so it's Kopf. Other ones are fairly um, elliptical, even ones closer, like NK, okay? Basically an asteroid, NK. Or is, it is, in fact, an asteroid. So definitely we got our, our examples of circular and elliptical orbits, all right? Now, what does that mean? Like, how do we, what, what's a, because now we're seeing a bunch of them together. Is there, is there some relationship, you know, because we can talk about one orbit in a meaningful way with Kepler's second law, an idea that it's faster when it's closer to the sun and slower when it's further away. But is there some common thread between all of them? Is there some statement we can make that would relate the orbits of Kopf and Halley to Ceres and Vesta and Venus and Mercury and even Earth. There is. There is a way to relate all those ideas. And to even relate the ideas of these orbits of natural objects to the orbits of man-made objects like the International Space Station and communication satellites. Okay? Well, how is that? How do we, how do we get there? Well, let's understand an orbit. Okay? Now, the orbits that exist naturally, like the Earth around the Sun, occurred because of the the hypothesized or theorized principles that led to the formation of the solar system from a disk of dust that over billions of years coalesced into what we know as the solar system. But we can kind of fast track that and make an artificial satellite by just throwing something really fast. 
So imagine this giant here, or maybe a, a, imagine a huge tower, right? Like this, some unbelievably large tower. And you're launching something from the top of it. Well, if I launch something and I give it some velocity VA, shown with this arrow, well, that's a huge velocity based on the scale of the Earth, right? And that means that the object is going to move really, really far and eventually crash down to the ground. Okay? So again, this would be like launching some like ballistic missile off the top of an unbelievably large um, mountain and having it cover half a continent before it eventually falls down. All right? Because it would eventually fall down because gravity's pulling on it. Everything falls down. Well, if I launch it even faster, well, now I can cover an entire continent, right? Now I can go way off in the Pacific Ocean, you know? Well, and that's what's happening over here in this picture too, right? Just progressively larger launches, getting it faster. Oh my gosh, look at that one. So fast that it's making it almost halfway around the world. Well, in both these pictures, A or B, okay? B being the ancient version, B being a modern version. Um, backwards, sorry. B being the ancient version, A being the modern version. Let's look at the final toss. Well, the final toss in the figure A is this one, VC, the final velocity. Well, if someone throws it just fast enough, well, look what happens. It arcs around, but it arcs just enough that it never hits the ground. So it comes all the way back around and hits the giant in the back of the head. All right, or Newton's original, kind of probably wood carving, right? It's just fast enough that it goes all the way around and just keeps going. Maybe it clips the top of the mountain, right? But get, do away at the mountain and launch something in space like we do, right? We send rockets up and then we fire some, you know, orient the rocket just right at the final stage, give it one last push, and now it just continues on its way all the way around, back where it started with nothing to stop it because it's above the atmosphere. It's well above mountaintops, you know, unbelievably large or not. And it just keeps going. And that's what a satellite is. An object that was given a large enough initial velocity that it falls around the world forever. And honestly, that's all the moon is. We think the moon is leftover debris from an unbelie unbelievably large collision of Earth with another planetoid that threw a bunch of rocks up into space that had huge velocities because of this you know, huge crater, right? Continent-sized crater that smashed into Earth. The whole Earth turned back to molten even though it had cooled, we think, at the time. And that, that incredibly fast, you know, ro pieces of rock and dust that was spewed into space just eventually formed the moon that just is falling around us forever, okay? Moon's traveling about a kilometer per second, just falling around Earth, never, never gonna hit, okay? Now, moon's pretty far, the moon is pretty far away. If you remember that scale photo, the moon is about 60, 60 Earth um, radii away, so, you know, quite distant as compared to these satellites that are actually relatively close based on the scale. Because, you know, there really are. Based on this, I mean, this could be a scale diagram here, this one. Even Newton's. We actually have satellites at, at those, those distances relative to the radius of the Earth. Okay? All right. So, there's a really good way of thinking about what a satellite is. Just throwing something really fast so it never hits the ground. Now, what about the rule, though? I said, you know, I said there should be some general rule to, to relate all these ideas. Okay? Well, that turns out to be Kepler's third law, okay? Because Kepler's third law says, well, that's great. You can throw something really fast and have it never hit the ground, but how do we know how fast to throw it? Well, it turns out that you can relate the period of the orbit, the time it takes to make a full rotation, to the distance from the center of the thing that's being orbited. So let's imagine, right? Here's the center of the Earth. And I'm gonna, and these, all these little dots here represent, uh, you know, our cloud of communication satellites that are around our, our modern world. Right? A lot of space junk up there. Well, not most of it's still in use, so don't call it junk. But it's amazing. We throw, we throw a lot of things in our own orbit. Okay, and so we then imagine, right? We have some path around, and it, it could be circular or somewhat elliptical, right? Doesn't matter. Remember, because ellipse are just a type of circle, and then this right here. We call this the semi-major axis, we call it A. And that, that way we can talk about it as either a circle for good approximation, or we can consider it to be some more elliptical. But regardless, we call this distance that we might usually call radius, we call it the A, and it's approximately the radius, okay? Would have units of kilometers or meters or something, okay? Meanwhile, the time to make a full rotation, so time for orbit, 
is called the period, the P, okay? So P is just the period. And Kepler's third law, based on just looking up in the sky, realized that there's a relationship between the period and the semi-major axis, effectively the radius. And it was this. So Kepler's third law just said that P squared, all right, equals A cubed. P squared equals A cubed. The period squared equals the radius cubed, or the period squared equals the semi-major axis cubed. And then it's right out of your textbook, okay? Now, that's great, and that's true if we compare everything to Earth. Okay, so this is true if P is in astronomical units. We presented that in the earlier chapters. That's just the average distance of Earth from the Sun. That, in other words, it's the semi-major axis of Earth. And A is in Earth years. As long as those are our units, then we can use P squared equals A cubed as an equation, as an exact equation, and, and find the period of Jupiter based on its semi-major axis or find the period of Venus based on its semi-major axis. Or for that matter, find the period of a comet um, Hellbop based on its semi-major axis. Now here's the thing. What all those have in common is that they're orbiting the sun, okay? Now, that means that it turns out that if we were to change units to more traditional units of kilometers instead of AU and seconds in, ter in terms of years, it wouldn't be a, a universal law that applies to other solar systems. It's totally unique to ours. We're just, we're just finding this commonality and using Earth as the, base, the baseline for that commonality, which is great, right? But Newton's laws wanted to be more universal, wanted to apply not just to our solar system, but to all, all of physical space, okay? Even, even though this was hundreds of years before we confirmed other solar systems existed, still the goal of Newton was to have universal laws, nothing specific, all right? So then taking Kepler's third law and making it universal, we end up with something usually called Newton's synthesis of Kepler's third law. P squared equals eight cubed, because I can't erase, unfortunately, sorry. And then now finally, Newton's version, And then I want P squared, and then I will still have our um, G over four pi squared. And then in the numerator, we'd have M1 plus M2. I think this is a good clear way of showing it. And then equaling A cubed. All right, so a couple of things then. First, the universal nature, and that's G. This ends up being this constant, this idea that gravity is attracted to the other gravity, and the pull of that attraction is exactly Z, a G. It's this universal pull between all matter, and it's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared, okay? That's a universal gravitational constant. It's just a number that we've, we've realized exists. We don't know where it comes from, but we've measured it very precisely, and it, and it appears to govern all the way that matter is pulled to other matter, all right? So, and this is just multiplication, by the way, p squared multiplied by that. The four pi squared is just a number, okay? It comes out of calculus. Um, but then where the M1 plus M2? Well, that's the sum of masses. So if it was a satellite, the M2, doesn't matter which one, but the M2 would be the mass of the satellite. M1, excuse me, yeah, M1 would be the mass of Earth, okay? And that's, so that's it. You just sum up the two. And here's the amazing thing about it. So a couple of things. First of all, this introduces the universal, you know, kind of fitting value of gravity, okay? So that was a huge contribution to Newton's third law by Newton. The other thing is this idea that, that we can apply it to any system, not just Earth and the Sun, and then other planets, right? Because we have, I mean, that, that was P squared equals A cubed, but that only works in astronomical units and Earth years. But now we can have P be in meters, and we can have A be in seconds. And then M1 plus M2, you might need, you might, you have to find those, but what are they? It's the mass of the satellite and the mass of the Thing that's being orbited and satellite could be artificial or or um you know natural like a moon so then let's think about it if m2 is a lot smaller than m1 then this whole part the thing in parentheses approximately is equal to m1 
So this actually turned out to be a big turning point in astronomy because it allowed us to make a very good estimate of the mass of planets by observing their smaller moons. Because if a moon is really small and a lot of planets have these kind of these trapped asteroid moons that are, you know, 10, 10 or 100,000 or a million times less massive than the planet itself. Well, we can just ignore the mass of that small natural moon and just find the mass of the planet by only knowing its period and its distance. And by it, it would be the satellite's period measured in seconds and the satellite's semi-major axis measured in axis in meters is, this, is really the workhorse of them all. All the, all the previous laws you need to understand, the relationships between um, Kepler's um, second law and angular momentum, great. Um, certainly Newton's th uh, third laws, they're, they're quite succinct. Um, but this, this is the one that, is, that I, I always think of as the one that, is mo is, that we'll see the most, certainly. It's gonna come up again in future chapters. And it's, it, is, it does so much because it can reveal mass, it can reveal period, it can reveal distance of orbit. Okay, radius. All right, so um, we'll wrap, wrap up with uh, kind of one final idea. So this is a modern computing pa uh, power, kind of a big giant um, supercomputer, but why? Why did I jump to that? Because we'll finish off with acknowledging that even though you know, Kepler's laws of motion were a huge step, a huge bit of progress from the ideas of Ptolemy and these little like, you know, um, epicircles that I mentioned briefly at the end of the last lecture, they still ignored the fact that it's not like gravity only acts between the Sun and Earth or the Sun and Jupiter or the Sun and Neptune. Gravity acts between all mass. And in fact, that's implied by this universal constant of gravity. Universal constant of gravity. It tells us that all matter is attracted to all other matter. Right now, you're pulling on the earth with a tiny bit of force, just like the earth is pulling on you. All matter attracts to the matter. If I, your body is pulling on objects that are free to move in your room, but the force is so tiny that it, it, it's actually hard to measure, all right? That's why it's only giant masses like masses of planets that make noticeable accelerations. But here's the thing, tiny variations can matter and for example, the Earth is being pulled on by all the other planets in the solar system as well as being pulled on by the Sun. Most significantly, it's pull, being pulled on by Jupiter, by far the biggest planet in the solar system. And that, that, you, that makes a measurable, although small, difference to our orbit. Our orbit actually isn't even an ellipse because there are these things called perturbations, all right? And the perturbations are disruptions in the ellipse, okay? Perturbations disrupt that ellipse. So now the math is much more complicated, but it started to be understood in the 19th century, in the 1800s. And those tiny perturbations, those variances from the ellipses that you know had been around now as a theory for 300 years by the 1800s, led to the discovery of Neptune. Because it turned out that we couldn't see Neptune with, with telescopes. It was just too far away, too faint. It took really you know, 20th century, 1900 telescopes before we could actually confirm that Neptune existed. But we were able to observe its pull on other planets. We noticed that it was pulling on Uranus. It was pulling on Saturn. And that, that, that variation, that those imperfect, those imperfect ellipses suggested that there was another planet called Neptune that was quite large, as big as Uranus, but much further away. And sure enough, it was there. And there are even current research showing that there might be another planet that is about a hundred times further than Neptune. And we can see its pull on, Pluto, on planets like Pluto. And the even, the even more, um, the dwarf planets like Pluto that are even further out. How fascinating is that? But again, we're at a situation where we literally can't find it with a telescope because it's so faint and it's so far away. So maybe in another century we'll confirm it. You know, so it's so interesting how... It, we have these big breakthroughs, these wonderful theories, but they are ultimately stepping stones and we can refine them and we can refine them with technology like supercomputers and find out tiny little variations. And of course, in the 1800s, they weren't, but they, did, they were able to do more complicated calculations. Ah, so hopefully this rather, rather in-depth and much bigger chapter than the first two gives us an idea of the foundations of astronomy and its relationship to physics.
And, and that's why I spent some time on it because this is a very foundational chapter that's gonna help us understand everything else that we see as we start, as we talk about these amazing things like binary star systems and planets around other stars and so on, okay? So th thank you so much for listening um, and you know, uh, letting me uh, hopefully you know, talk your ear off in this video. Um, and you know, send me any questions and just uh, you know, keep, uh, keep thinking about these ideas in astronomy. Highly recommend reading the chapter too. Read the chapter for, for this one more, more than any other chapter. I think it's a bit, well, maybe more than the first two. It's very important that you spend some time with it. All right, I'll wrap it up here. Thanks again. I'll talk to you all soon.